Thank you for joining us for the Expert in Action, Another Vital Sign webinar. This is being pre <clears throat> presented by Dr. Ronald Dwinnells, MD. He's a pediatrician who has served since 1998 as the Chief Executive Officer at the Ohio Northeast Health System, located in Northeast Ohio. He is a frequent speaker on national level discussing topics of health disparities, health care leadership, and health care administration. Um, I would like to present Dr. Dwinnells to you now. I will change the screen so he can start his presentation. There you go, Dr. Dwinnells. Just click on that box and we'll see your screen. Okay. Is this good, Chris? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, well, hello everyone. It's um, this is my first time doing a webinar, so um, uh, may may feel a little awkward to me because I, I'm used to seeing people's eyes and body language and so forth, uh, and that cues me into uh, knowing whether I'm being bored or, uh, or or I'm being boring or not boring. So, anyway, uh, please bear with me um, if I uh, don't come across uh, uh, to to your needs. But anyway, uh, yes, I did, I did entitle this Another Vital Sign because I feel that SBIRT is a form of vital sign, uh, no different than taking a blood pressure or respiratory rate or, or heart rate. Um, I think it's a vital sign for your behavioral health, your mental health status, and, and, uh, and so forth. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's why I named this, and that's, that's actually uh, the way we, uh, quote, sell it to our uh, patients. Uh, I do want to make a, a couple of disclosures first. As you saw, I am a pediatrician by education and training and not a psychologist or psychiatrist or behavioral health worker or social worker or, or any of those. Uh, I have a, uh, a, a personal interest in, in behavioral health and, um, and I think it's, it's intriguing. Uh, and I also have a professional interest from the perspective that I am a CEO of an organization and and I do want to improve uh, our rate of understanding and identifying and, and treating folks who have behavioral health problems. Uh, just before we start, uh, and, and again, I'm, I'm not 100% versed in a lot of your folks' terms, so uh, in my, my world and in my mind, uh, when I talk about behavioral health, I'm talking about both mental health illness and substance abuse types of uh, issues such as alcohol dependency or, or drug abuse. And then comorbidity, uh, in, in this reference, um, I, I want to use comorbidity uh, defined as both having a physical uh, health problem as well as a behavioral health problem. So that's just so that we can all be on the same page. Um, so before I start with, uh, with the formal slides, uh, Chris, can we do the first poll uh, for the folks? Chris, can you hear me? Uh, yes, sorry, I'm just getting it set up. Okay, oh, okay. Here's your okay. question. Okay, um, I can only have so many um, characters in these questions, so let me read the full question to you. If you believe the health care system is not adequate as it relates to behavioral health issues, please indicate where you think the breakdown is. We do not diagnose patients with behavioral health issues in a clinical setting adequately. We do not treat or manage them adequately. We do not have the capacity and or resources to take care of our behavioral health patients adequately, all of the above. And I do not believe we have an inadequate health care system as it relates to behavioral health problems. So if you will, um, yeah, just continue clicking where you think the problem lies. And if you don't think there's a problem, indicate that as well. OK, tell me when I can move okay. on. Here. Yeah. Um, OK, I'm going to close the poll now. It looks like we have a pretty good representation. And then I'll share the results with everybody. Um, Okay, 3% of the people say that they think that um, we do not diagnose patients with behavioral 
health issues in a clinical setting adequately. Another 3% say we don't manage them adequately. Um, then we have, uh, okay, then we have 12% who feel that they don't have the capacity or the resources to take care of their behavioral health patients adequately. And 82%, um, the whole rest of the group, think that it's all of the above. And none of the people um, are of the opinion that everything is fine the way it is. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thanks you want for, the thank second everyone. one now as well? I'm sorry, what? You want the second poll as well? Um, now let's wait on that just for okay. a little bit. Sure. Um, Okay, so again, I, I, I mentioned my disclosures at the beginning, and uh, so I am not an expert at behavioral health. I, you know, it's one of those I play one, but, uh, uh, but so I'm, I'm going to start out fairly simple. And my whole purpose of this um, uh, this presentation is to show you what we've done and some of the interesting results that that we've obtained uh, through our uh, data gathering and so forth. So. At the very beginning, I, I questioned, and then I had a lot of discussions with our local behavioral health partners. Um, you know, do we do we have a problem? And you know, and and I think it's really obvious when when we read the papers every single day or watch the news every single day, you get headlines like this: uh, shooting rampage at Navy Yard in D.C. leaves 13 dead. Well, we know that can't be a normal behavior. Uh, th there has to be something involved, either either mental health issue or are they, you know, drug addicted or, or what. So, uh, but, you know, and I understand these are simple concepts, but uh, I just wanted to make make this point here. A woman killed in D.C. chase was delusional. Uh, and I think we all remember a lot of these headlines. A man sets himself on fire on the National Mall. Well, again, these aren't, these can't be normal behaviors um, as, as we define it in society. Drunk pilot caught just before takeoff um, was 4.5 times the legal limit to fly. That's kind of scary. Um, you know, we don't we don't want our um, airline pilots <laughs> being being drunk when they're they're flying. Uh, these are a couple of local ones uh, in in my area in the Youngstown area. Man involved in mob hit faces drug charges. Um, two top coaches from Valley quit over drug use. These were a couple of coaches uh, who came from from our area, uh, who made it big on the national scene, uh, but they were um, uh, found um, using illicit drugs, and uh, and they they were confronted, and they ended up quitting. This was uh, one of the Florida universities. Uh, police arrest Cray, Cray. City judge orders mental health check. Well, this guy, Cray, was actually a recent mayoral candidate for Youngstown, uh, and he was in jail most of the, the period. Um, but it, it, And he was in the news all the time because he was having all these weird antics and so forth. Uh, interestingly, just as a side note, he did receive 85 votes. Um, I'm not sure what that tells you about our area, but, um, but he did get votes while he was in jail. Um, so, you know, so this goes back to that question that I had uh, when I first kind of began thinking about this two, three years ago. Uh, do you believe we have a behavior and health problem in this country? And, and if so, I kind of thought, thought about it through several different processes. You know, it, are we not identifying uh, behavior health issues, uh, especially in the clinical setting? Um, are we missing patients who, who may have an alcohol problem or a drug problem or, or in, in our case, what we looked at was depression. Um, and, and if we are identifying them, them well, um, is there a treatment issue? Are we referring adequately enough? Are we re referring appropriately? Uh, are we initiating treatment properly uh, as, as medical providers, as physicians, nurse practitioners, and so forth? And then, uh, and then do we have a capacity problem? Um, do we have enough enough behavioral health workers out there, behavioral health organizations, they can handle um, a large influx of, uh, of behavioral health related problems. And, and if we do, do we have the, the, the financial support? Um, are, are legislations uh, passed to support, um, you know, uh, us having adequate behavioral health capacity? 
And I think probably most of us will say no. Um, but um, anyway, so just a couple of interesting things. Again, I'm, I'm just taking you on a journey through what I went in terms of when I was trying to learn and understand behavioral health issues. So I read this uh, in the Columbus Dispatch uh, a few months ago. And this was from a schizoaffective disorder patient, as you see in the bottom. She said, it, it's so hard for people to be proactive, like prevention, to spend the money up front for early identification and treatment. And so we don't end up spending money on the back end, in our jails, in the hospitals. If we spend it up front, we could prevent all the big ticket items. Well, that's kind of, to me, it's kind of one of those dumb moments. Like, yeah, OK, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and in, uh, in, in the same article, a, uh, a psychiatry professor at OSU said, we need to provide better access to treatment, better treatment and reprioritization of how society approaches the problem. Are we taking mental illness as seriously as we should be taking it? I think the answer is no. And the more I delved into this whole world, I, I think um, the, the professor is right. Now, so again, through my journey, I, I read a lot, and I, you know, I, I came across a lot of facts and so forth, and just a few facts, and there's, there's tons of them out there. But mental health affects one in four adults in any given year. It seems like no matter what literature I read, it seems like it's a consistent 25% of the population seems to have some mental health issues. Um, and I thought this was interesting, that mental disorders begins at an early age. Um, it half begin by 14 years, and three quarters begin by 24. And and this is what what I thought was impressive. Uh, it is a chronic disease of the young, and I never thought about it that way. But that's a uh, that's pretty profound statement. Um, depression is a risk factor for dementia. And that's something an article that I recently came across. And as we all know, we there's uh, a lot of uh, folks that are being diagnosed with Alzheimer's dementia and other types of dementia, and um, and I thought this was an interesting correlation. Um, we also know that uh, this has huge cost uh, uh, issues in our society. The annual cost of alcohol-related motor vehicle accidents is greater than fifty-one billion dollars. That was in 2010. Uh, societal cost for substance abuse. Uh, was $510.8 billion in 2009. And then the estimated societal cost of mental illness, and they defined it as direct and indirect, for roughly a 10-year period was $3.2 trillion. So, so clearly, it has uh, significant um, financial ramifications to our society, um, the, these types of problems. And, then, uh, and we know that comorbidities, such as depression, co-occurring with diabetes, uh, occurs about 28% of uh, the time over a lifetime. I thought that was very, very interesting because we clinically we see many folks that come in uh, that we treat diabetes, um, and and we know they have some other issues going on, um, but sometimes we don't uh, address them, and that's kind of my whole purpose of this effort. Uh, and then as much as 70% of primary care visits stem from psychosocial issues, and I thought that was an interesting. Uh, Effect. So, so a, a general question, you know, again that that I ask is, from from a healthcare delivery perspective, and again I'm I'm going back to my roots as a physician, uh, as as a from a healthcare delivery perspective, who do you think would be an ideal situation to diagnose, identify, treat, and or intervene with a person's behavioral health issue, uh, such as depression, alcohol, or substance? And of course, I put a hint down there. But obviously, I I think, and again, I'm I'm coming from a medical end. I believe that um, um, physicians, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, all the the, the the primary medical folks should be um, gatekeepers to this. So so I went back and looked at some of our data. If any of you folks are in FQHC organizations, and that's what we are. Um, we have a reporting requirement called the UDS, or it stands for Uniform Data System. And it's, a, it's basically an annual reporting mechanism to, uh, to, the, uh, to HRSA. So if you look at 20, 2011 here, um, 2011 we were required to report alcohol-related diagnosis, substance abuse diagnosis, and depression diagnosis. 
but but uh, they just wanted to know how many of our diagnosis of those items were primary. So so these numbers represent the primary diagnosis as opposed to secondary or tertiary. So uh, only 0.04 percent. Uh, we were only identifying 0.04% of our patient population as having an alcohol-related diagnosis. And then substance abuse, it was 0.03%, uh, and then depression was 0.78%. So, so less than 1% so, so of, um, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm actually in a in a conference area, and they must have had the phone on. But anyway, the the point here is is that um, less than one percent of our patient population was diagnosed of, uh, of having any of these items uh, as a primary diagnosis. So my thought is, wow, we we have a really um, healthy population. Um, you know, unlike the the national norms. So in 2012, we were required to to identify any level of the diagnosis. So it could have been primary, secondary, tertiary, and so forth. So, but still, only 0.13% um, were diagnosed of alcohol-related, 0.13% uh, of substance abuse, and then 1.7% of depression. So less than 2%. It did double from 2011 by adding the, you know, the, the secondary and tertiary factors. But, but still, I still think that tells me that we got a really, really um, healthy population in, in Youngstown, Ohio, and that intuitively that just didn't seem right. So, so then I started asking, okay, so is it possible for a patient who comes in for a physical problem, such as a sore throat, um, could they also have a co-occurring behavioral health problem? Well, obviously that's kind of a, you know, it's probably a sarcastic type of question, but, um, uh, and then if these patients do have a behavior health issue, uh, do you think that they will bring it up with a doctor at the medical visit? Um, I don't think so, um, because I think patients are programmed to think that when they go to the medical office, they come in for a physical problem. And I don't think they think about talking to their doctor uh, about behavior health issues. So anyway, that's just my opinion. Um, and then, and if if the patient does bring it up, does the um, the busy medical practitioner want to talk about it? Um, will they stop in the middle of what they're doing and start asking? Um, so tell me about your drinking problem. Um, I, I don't I don't think that's going to occur. But anyway, I think hey Chris, I think we're ready for the second um, poll question for me. Chris. Hello. Hello, Chris. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm here. I was oh. just preparing. Um, I oh. had somebody say that uh, the vocals were cutting out a little bit. So if you could get just a little bit closer to the speaker. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. is that better? Okay, let me um, start the second poll here. Okay, here is the next that we'd like you to answer. And I will read, again, the full um, question since it's, it's a shortened on the screen. What do you perceive as barriers to performing an expert process in the clinical medical setting? The process is time consuming for the medical provider and the clinical staff. The patient who is being seen for medical problem does not want to discuss any behavioral health related topics with the medical providers. Number three option is the medical provider is not very knowledgeable or proficient or up to date about medical health matters. Um, the fourth option is it is inappropriate to deal with matters regarding behavioral health problems in a clinical setting. And then the last option is the process is too costly. So um, if you would just mark whatever you feel is the most appropriate, um, we will get your ideas on that.
Okay, I'm going to uh, close the poll now and share the results. Um, let's see. Uh, 47%, so almost half of you feel that the process is just time consuming for the medical provider and the clinical staff. 9% um, think that the, the patient won't want to discuss any behavioral health related topics with the medical providers if he's in for a medical problem. And 41%, second highest, feels that the medical provider is not very knowledgeable, proficient, or up-to-date about behavioral health matters. Uh, nobody chose number four, that it's inappropriate. And 3% think that the process is too costly. Okay, I will hide that now. So Dr. Dwinnells, it's back to you. Okay, thanks. Uh, can you hear me better? Is that uh, better on your end? I think it's okay. I'll see if I get any more comments, and then I'll let you know. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, that was uh, that was very interesting um, because, uh, and I, I need to tell you this story. So, there was an interviewer uh, back in the '40s who asked Willie Sutton if if uh, if uh, a lot of you may not know who Willie Sutton was. He was a notorious bank robber back in the '40s. Uh, not that I lived back in the '40s, but. Um, but anyway, I read about it, and uh, the question was, why do you rob banks? And I think most of you know this story. Uh, and he said, because that's where the money is. So when I wanted to, when I got this bright idea about wanting to um, uh, administer ESPERT to our patients, uh, of course, uh, I get all kinds of flack from my doctors. And, um, you know, one of the main questions was, well, why do we want to ask our medical patients anything about their behavioral health status? Uh, that was one question amongst others, but so obviously my answer is, well, that's where the patient is. Um, you know, it's, that's who comes to see us. Uh, yeah, just because they have a physical problem. Again, my hypothesis here is that um, that they also could have a behavioral health issue. And then I also told them that um, you know, if you ask, they will tell. And and a lot of the docs didn't think uh, that 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 would uh, occur. So. Um, Anyway, but that, that's been my mantra, and, and I want to go through some of the uh, data that we got and, um, to indicate that that is a true statement. Um, so are there any questions or comments at this point? Um, let's see. I do have a question. It says, um, or comment, an issue for us is that ESPERT is only reimbursable via Medicaid when done by a licensed medical provider, i.e. not a peer or other resource person. Okay. Is that a question or just a comment? Comment. Okay. I, I can talk about that in, in a little bit. Okay. And then um, when the next time you stop, I'm going to want to do a couple poll questions too, okay? Okay. Okay. Um, all right, I'll go ahead and go on then. So, so again, because I'm the CEO, um, you know, if you can see my body language, uh, you'd probably laugh at it. But, but because I'm the CEO, uh, I, I kind of pushed it, and uh, because I believed in the process and so forth. So, uh, so I designed this little diagram for our staff uh, when we were preparing our staff and our uh, physicians and, and um, nurse practitioners and PAs uh, on on how the process would work. So. So the patient comes into the front desk, uh, and then the, the usual demographics and so forth are obtained. I did want to get veteran status on, on everyone um, because I wanted to see how uh, how the veterans were were specifically affected um, by either having depression or alcohol or, or drugs and so forth. Um, but anyway, uh, at this point, the uh, expert uh, pre pre-screening questionnaire was um, was given. And I'll show a slide of that in a second. But So that was administered with instruction that uh, uh, our doctors want you to complete this so that um, uh, so that we can help you better and, uh, and this is like a vital sign. So they would go to the waiting room uh, and then fill out these, uh, um, it's actually five questions. And then um, 
then at the intake process, the medical assistant or the nurse would, would look at it. And if any of those questions were deemed positive or answered positive, I'm sorry, uh, either the DAS for the, uh, for the drug, um, positive drug question, or the audit for the positive alcohol question, or the PHQ-9 for the depression question uh, would, would kick in. Uh, all that was uh, um, um, placed into the EHR and uh, documented in there, and um, uh, and then the, the provider would come in and review the results, uh, and then do what they needed to do, whether it was an intervention or referral, um, uh, place them on medications or, or whatever, uh, and then um, we. We did a, a bit of a patient survey, too, a post-test um, patient survey, which I'll share with you in a little bit. Um, and then, then they were discharged. Um, and then we did keep uh, tracks on, on the referral and so forth. So anyway, I just wanted to share the process with you. It's a very, very simple. And we elected to, uh, to go through the process on every single patient with every visit. Uh, I, I, of course, I got a lot of uh, questions and slack on that, but, uh, but I felt it was important because we know that on the average, uh, a patient user at our organization utilizes the organization about three, uh, three times a, uh, a year. So that's an average. And um, uh, if they came in January but then come back until June, well, to me, a lot of things could have happened in, in those uh, interceding months. And I wanted to make sure that I was able to, to capture any, uh, any problems or anything that, that occurred in between time. So, um, um, and again, I, I viewed this as a vital sign. So, so we did do it with every single visit um, with every single patient. And, and this was adapted from the uh, Esbert Oregon. Uh, and the, the, the website is phenomenal. Uh, if any of you are from the Oregon site, thank you. Uh, but uh, but it's, a, it's a great pre-screening question. And again, we modified it a little bit and uh, said that this is an important vital sign for your, your health. Um, so go back, going back to that concept that people want to tell, uh, if you ask, they will tell. Well, during a six-month test period uh, from February through August, we had 3,125 patients come to our Youngstown site. Um, just to back up a second, we have six physical locations located in um, three different counties in northeast Ohio. And um, the, the two that I'm primarily going to refer to is our Youngstown site and our Warren West site. We used our Youngstown site as the test site and uh, our Warren West site as the uh, control site. Uh, the demographics are similar. and um, and we felt that that would be interesting just to compare uh, the two. So during the six-month period at the Youngstown site, we had 3,125 patients that kept their appointments. Um, we performed 2,482 um, pre-screening um, questions. Uh, we took out the less than 18-year-old kids, um, so that's 364, and uh, there were some uh, clerical oversight that caused 193 patients not to uh, get the screening. Um, but anyway, look at the screening refusal uh, numbers. Uh, only 86 uh, refused to take it because it was optional. They didn't have to do this. Um, but only 86 refused. And that's a 3.3% uh, refusal rate uh, or and a 97% um, uh, performance rate. So. To me, this tells me that you know people want to want to talk about it. They they don't have a problem uh, disclosing that kind of information. Uh, this is another interesting uh, set of data. So, out of the experts given, 2,482, um, there were 793 that tested positive for depression, 542 that tested positive for alcohol, and 235 that tested positive for drugs, which is a 63.3% rate. So 63.3% of the patients walking into our medical office was having something positive here. Uh, and then there's combinations uh, as well as probably most of you uh, 
figured. But uh, I thought that was staggering. What's really more interesting is um, up until about the fifth month, we were running at a rate closer to 70%. So, you know, seven out of ten people walking in had something going on, um, which I thought was, was pretty uh, mind-boggling. So this is some of our survey questions. Uh, one of the questions was, prior to seeing the doctor, you were asked questions about your alcohol and drug uh, use and mood. Were you upset by having to complete these questions? I wanted to know if patients felt that this was an intrusive process, uh, or did they look at it as, as an opportunity to maybe bring up the subject. So you can see here that 91% uh, uh, said that, no, they weren't upset about this, uh, and 9% said that, yes, they were. So to me, that's an overwhelming number that said, it's OK to ask me these questions. If questions about drug slash alcohol use and mood can help doctors, would you recommend that others complete them? Well, overwhelmingly, 99% overwhelmingly said yes. So you know, again, they, they're looking at this process as something very favorable. How satisfied were you about the feedback provided about the results of these questions? So that was kind of a, a, a mix, uh, but most said that they were pretty satisfied um, with, with uh, any of the feedback. Now, this gets really, really interesting. So before today, so before we administer this test, when was the last time you were asked by a doctor about your drinking or drug use? So 66% said that they were asked in the last 12 months, which kind of went against my thought process because I didn't think the, the, our providers asked them. Uh, but the response is that two-thirds are saying that, yeah, my doctor um, uh, asked me about uh, drug and alcohol uh, use. 17% said um, they were asked more than 12 months ago, and 16% said they were never asked. And then we did the same for the, uh, for the mood, the depression. So 72% said that their, their provider did ask them within the past 12 months uh, if they have um, any mood problems or any depression problems. So, you know, the bottom line here is, is, is that um, it looks like they're being asked. Again, I go back to this slide, which shows, okay, so if we're asking them and we know that 63.3% of the people walking in um, are answering positive, but then our diagnos diagnostic rate is really low. Um, something doesn't doesn't fit here. Um, so again, so if we're asking, and these people are saying, yeah, I got a problem, but then we're not making the diagnosis. What what's the problem here? Um, now we go we go here. Did, did you receive alcohol drug counseling today? Now remember, this is this says today. So this is after they took that expert test. 95% said no. So, OK, but we know, let's see, we know that 63% are answering positive. Um, but 95% but 95 said that they didn't receive any kind of counseling. Um, and 5% said, yeah, they did. Um, so that, that's kind of interesting. Um, prior to your visit today, have you ever been told by a doctor or nurse that you have an alcohol or drug problem? 91% um, said no. Well, OK, that kind of fits with, with uh, that, but it doesn't fit with, um, you know, with that. Hey, we're, we're asking them these questions, but we're not really addressing uh, anything. Uh, so. Anyway, I, again, I thought this was interesting, and we did the same thing for the depression. So again, I go back to this slide. Uh, we, I think we're kind of bad in making diagnosis um, of these types of problems. So, so then I go back after I, I review some of these, and of course I have more and more questions. Uh, and then you know, I came to some conclusion that uh, Medical providers, first of all, medical providers are in a unique situation to identify behavioral health problems. Um, but I don't think we're too good at um, uh, talking uh, to our patients about them um, 
it, it seems like we're improving our identification rate, but on the back end, we're not doing a real good job in terms of uh, talking to them uh, and, and explaining about the problem and so forth. Uh, and then this is probably more anecdotal, but patients who go to medical doctors for a specific physical problem don't think they should bring up problems dealing with behavior issues. And we didn't formally ask that question in the survey, but um, but these are questions that that um, that I've talked with patients about, and they, you know, most of the patients are in the mindset that you know I'm going to the doctor because I have a, you know, I have headaches or I have sore throat or you know or, or whatever, but they don't perceive going to the medical folks um, to address their behavioral health problems. Um, so, so then the question is, well, why are providers not too good about asking um, questions? Well, uh, this issue about reimbursement. Um, the reimbursement structure is poor for this service. Um, in Ohio, it's still non-existent. Uh, we can't get reimbursed uh, for it. But again, uh, we felt that it was it was very, very important that, that we went ahead and proceed uh, doing this uh, despite not being reimbursed for the, um, for the, for the process. Um, providers are uncomfortable with the subject and not very well trained or up to date on these matters. I, as a physician, can 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 talk about that. Um, in, in med school, yeah, we didn't get a whole lot of uh, behavior health types of um, uh, problem solving. We got a little bit of psychiatry, and um, I think we had eight weeks of rotation in the psych uh, unit, and that's about it. Um, again, I'm a pediatrician, so I got nothing. Uh, postgraduate, um, but I don't think we're doing a really good job in terms of teaching uh, these uh, these issues to our medical students and, and our residents. Uh, and then, you know, and then the big thing is time. Um, you know, when, when and, and I've also been in this situation too, when, when you're really busy, you may look at somebody and say, you know, I, I think that person has a, has a depression problem, but I don't really want to bring it up because I'm, I'm so behind already and I want to focus on that medical problem that they came in on. So I think there's a lot of dynamics involved in terms of why we haven't done SBIRT or why, don't, why we don't bring up those uh, types of issues uh, in, a, in a medical clinical setting. So anyway, I'm at the next question and comment section. Are there any questions? Hey, Chris, are you there? Chris, Dr. Gwinnells was... Sorry. I'm sorry. Somebody was talking to me. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm at a question and comment section, so I don't oh, know... Yes, if... yes, yeah. thank you. There are a few. Um, yeah. One says, great work outlining the process. You mentioned that you pushed the process a little bit with your team. How did you respond in front of line staff who said, we don't have time to do another project. Okay, that's a really, really good question because uh, that that I purposely didn't put that one in yet because um, I do have data on that. Um, but um, I said yeah, at the beginning when we had no data, I said, well, I, I can't perceive that this is going to take that much more time. You saw the uh, the, the expert pre-screening questions, and, and it's really simple and really fast, and it is patient self-administered, so uh, it didn't take anybody's time to administer it, um, but it did take time on the back end where we were reviewing it and administering the, uh, the second subsequent test. But I do have a, uh, a set of data that I want to share with the audience um, on the time factor because it's, it's pretty eye-opening. So I will get to that uh, during the next part of this uh, um, presentation. Okay. Um, here's another one. Is it true that in order for expert to be reimbursed, the provider must have three plus hours of training? And how do you provide this training to PCP? Hmm. Well, first of all, I don't know if that's true because in Ohio, again, um, there um, we we can't get that reimbursement rate. I I believe um, that. There's legislation uh, there, and somebody told me the other day that they were really close to passing the legislation. But uh, I don't know. In some states, I'm, I'm assuming that some states um, do. Well, I'm not assuming. I do know that there are some states that state Medicaid that do reimburse for that. Uh, but I don't know what the criteria is, and they may be different 
uh, with different uh, states. So that could very well be true, but to, to fulfill the, if there's an education requirement, um, we, we do have our providers, or we did have our providers go through an expert training uh, through uh, IRETA and, uh, and, and some local folks, and, um, um, and that's well over three hours, so you know, I think uh, that might satisfy that criteria. Um, here's another one. If they say they are depressed, what screen do you use for further evaluation? Uh, well, the, the depressed one goes to the PHQ-9. Um, and then, and I think most folks know that uh, the BAS, the audit, and the PHQ-9 are all scored. They're, you can quantify those, uh, those numbers. And um, uh, then once they're quantified, they are put in categories and, and so forth. So they are quantifiable. Uh, but we use the PHQ-9 uh, for ours. Um, uh -huh. Do you track using EMRS? Uh, I'm sorry, um, what for? Yes. It says, do you track using EMRS? Yes, yes, uh, electronic medical records, yes. Uh, we do. In fact, uh, the, the VAST and the audit and the PHQ-9 are all built into the, our, um, our electronic health records, and, uh, and they are automatically scored. Um, by that. So we can actually track and follow um, uh, the scores. And that's the, the other thing that we've been wanting, or not been wanting, but we are doing is, uh, again, every time a patient comes in, we are doing these expert study or expert tests, and therefore we can track the scores as we go on. So theoretically, uh, I guess in an ideal world type of thing, if a person has been in five times in a year, uh, we will know the score of each um, each visit, and then we can see if the interventions or the talks or whatever uh, has improved those scores uh, over time. So, uh, but yes, uh, I made it a long-winded answer. But yes, the uh, the the answer is um, yes, we do have electronic health records, and and I don't. I think it would be very difficult to do this without the electronic health records. Obviously, it's possible, but. Um, but this makes it so much easier. Uh, we can track all kinds of data with it. Okay. And um, here's one last one. How many hours of training did you provide your clinicians? Um, it, uh, I can't remember total. Uh, the way we did it over at the Youngstown site is uh, we had a, um, I, I, again, I sent all the providers and all the um, the, the clinical staff workers to the expert training, um, and again, I can't remember how many hours that was, but I, I do know it was more than three. Uh, and then we had some internal in-services that, that I did, uh, and then we also um, uh, had some training on, uh, on interviewing techniques and, and so forth. So I would say if, if I estimated the cost, um, my CFO isn't here with me because she knows all those numbers, but um, but I would say um, probably no more than five to six hours total if you put it all together. Okay. Um, do you know if there are any changes expected in reimbursement so providers can have some incentive to intervene early? Um, no, I don't. Um, again, you know, we we in Ohio don't don't get that, but my suspicion from an administrative perspective uh, and, and trying to figure out what's going on with our whole health delivery program in this country, I, I'm thinking that um, things like um, uh, our medical organizations being involved in patient-centered medical homes, uh, the health homes and so forth, I believe that future is tied in to, to uh, those status, if, if you are PCMA certified and home health certified and so forth, and if, re, if reimbursements are tied into that, obviously um, these types of exercises and these types of efforts, uh, would I would assume, would go a long ways in terms of um, um, having some effect on indirect reimbursements, if, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, 
Um, mm -hmm. But directly, I don't. Again, in Ohio, we don't have any experience. In that okay, and I have one last question, and then if you don't okay. mind, I'll go do a couple poll questions. Okay. Um, we are only getting about three percent positive screens from the audit and DAF. I am interested in how our processes differ. How, how, I, I didn't catch the very last. Uh, she said, "I'm interested in how our processes differ." But she's only getting a three percent positive screen. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Again, uh, you know, our process is. Um, um, again, I don't know that particular um, person uh, set up, but uh, we are screening every single patient with every single visit. Maybe that's, that's the difference. Um, uh, maybe one time they come in and they're not going to answer positive, maybe the next time they do. I, I, I don't know. That's hard to say um, why there's such a discrepancy in, in, in the, um, the, the numbers. Uh, again, uh, the other part is the, the pre-screening is self-administered. Um, I don't know, again, how this is done in this questioner's um, process, but um, if, if somebody else uh, administers it for them, um, to some patients may not want to say. I, I don't know. It's, it's hard to say. So I, I, I can't really answer that particular question at this point. I, I don't know. I would have to know and understand that person's process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, we're going to just take a brief um, break now in order to ask you a couple questions. We want to find out more about you as our audience. So um, these are just another quick poll here. We want to know what is your current professional role. Are you a counselor, therapist, social worker? Um, are you a nurse or nurse practitioner, physician or physician assistant, a program or unit administrator, university student or faculty, or other? And if you are other and want us to know what that is, <coughs> you can send your answer in a chat or in the questions box so we have that. Okay, looks like we uh, the first one I'm going to close now and share the results. Oops, sorry. Sorry. Uh -uh. So, wait a minute. Sorry. Oh, uh, this is becoming a mess here. Okay. Um, okay, so for the first poll, let me share this now. Um, okay, 44% uh, of the attendees are counselors, therapists, social workers, or caseworkers. We have 14% who are nurse, uh, nurse practitioners, physicians, or physician's assistant. 9% um, program or unit administrators. 7% uh, university student faculty, and 26% other. So. Um, I don't see anybody putting down what other is. So we'll just leave that as it is. Thank you. OK, now I'll do the next one. Sorry, I don't know what the problem is here. OK, this is um, what field do you represent? Medical health, or I'm sorry, mental health, addictions, physical health, education, or EAP? So um, what's your, your basic field? Chris, this is Holly. We did have some people indicate we have a physician and internal medicine and program director, a research okay, scientist, you. and they're um, answering a psychologist. They're answering in the questions tab. Okay, thank you. Thank you guys for participating. Okay. Um, 
also for this, in addition to the um, people that Holly noted, 27% um, are here from mental health, 43% from addiction, 8% physical health, and 22% education, and nobody's attending from an EAP. So thank you for that. And um, I've got two more real quick ones. These are um, just quick yes, no. Do you currently conduct expert interventions in your facility? Okay, I'll close this one and share it. Um, so far, 60% uh, do, do not conduct expert right now, and 40% do. And then for our last question, do you see your agency using expert in the future if they don't already now? Yes or no? Okay, well, there's a real quick answer here. I'll, um, I'll just uh, close this now since it's um, uh, pretty obvious <laughs> here. 94% um, of the attendees feel that their agency um, is or will be using expert in the future, and 6% don't expect that to happen. So thank you all very much for participating in this. Um, uh, back to the analysis, I'll turn it back to you now. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Chris. That's, uh, that was very interesting. So it looks like um, uh, I'm, I'm predominantly speaking to counselors, social workers, and so forth, right? Yes. So, so anyway, after getting some of this, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm taking on, the, on this journey of mine where I'm trying to learn and understand this. and and trying to do something uh, with my organization about it. So, so you know, so what, what is the solution here? And, um, and you know, and, and obviously we go back to that one uh, professor's comment from OSU, let's be proactive and, and ask our med medical patients if they've got a problem. It appears to me with these preliminary numbers, uh, that six-month test period, that uh, number one patients um, uh, do want to tell us uh, that they have a problem, and uh, and, and and number two, um, once once we find it, uh, some of it doesn't seem like we're doing a whole lot about it. So that's that's a real problem. But anyway, uh, so so when we started our expert application, our our goals was uh, first we wanted to improve our identification rate. Again, we go back to that slide I showed three three four times now. Uh, our rate of diagnosis was really poor. Um, well. Mind you, the term identification and diagnosis here are two different things. So first of all, we have a 63.3% identification rate, but they're not all being officially diagnosed, and there's a lot of reasons for it. They may not really meet the criteria. They may just have the propensity uh, for that, uh, or um, uh, the, doc the doctors or the providers may not feel totally comfortable with making committing to paper that, that particular diagnosis. So, uh, but we wanted to improve our um, identification rate of our medical patients who have behavioral health issues. And then, then once we identify them, because that's, to me, that's the first step, is you got to know to be able to do something, uh, we wanted to increase our level of involvement through intervention, treatment, or referral. And, and obviously, all that fits into the, uh, the SBIRT model. So, uh, again, we, we did this as a research project, a, a clinical research project, because I wanted to prove some points, uh, especially to our providers, but yet I wanted to be able to share our data with, uh, with my colleagues out there to, uh, to show that, hey, you know what, this is, this is good stuff. So our, our alternative hypothesis, if you all remember your statistics, um, is uh, we felt that the rate of diagnosis, intervention, and referral for behavioral health issues will increase by administering a behavioral health questionnaire to all medical patients with every medical visit. And that's kind of, that pretty much summarizes what I've been talking about um, earlier. 
So, so this is our diagnostic rate uh, during the test period. So, so this in blue here, this was our behavioral health diagnosis uh, in 2012 during that exact six month um, time period from March to August. So we wanted to, we didn't want any kind of um, external things uh, 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 messing up our data. So we didn't do it in the winter months or, or we didn't do it you know, in the fall months or summer months or whatever, but we, we went with the exact same time period of February to August 2012. So we looked at the data there and we had 330 people uh, that were, that had official behavioral health diagnosis. During the same period in 2012 or 2013, during our test period at this is Youngstown Community Health Center, we had 627, which is a 90% increase in the diagnostic rate. So, so that pretty much tells you that you know that that exercise of providing the expert was effective. It improved awareness of our providers, and uh, and therefore I believe that um, that in turn improved the diagnosis. Uh, at our control site, and this is Warren West, at, during the exact same time period in, in 2012, it was 186 diagnosis. Uh, and then uh, during the test period, analogous to this test period here, uh, we had 192 for an increase of 3.23%. And again, I think um, some of you who, who are very knowledgeable about statistics, there's a concept called confounding variables, which, uh, which means that um, just by talking about it, because I've talked about this in our organizational meetings, I've talked about it one-on-one -on -one with our various doctors at all of our sites, and, and, uh, but I didn't officially implement it here, I implemented here, but I think these confounding variables might attribute to the slight increase in the, in the uh, diagnostic rate. But, Obviously, this is statistically significant. We have a 90% increase here compared to 3.23% here where we didn't do anything. So the time question, everybody asked about the time question. So we had two doctors involved at our, our uh, Youngstown site. So in, in 2012, uh, and, and again, we looked at the same time period, uh, an average, it took one hour, 40 minutes for uh, a patient to get through our uh, clinic in Youngstown, uh, and that included from the time into the door until they were exited um, uh, by the, uh, the front desk personnel. So, uh, so the whole process on the average took one hour 40 minutes for this Dr. S. Uh, during the test period, it took one hour 45 minutes, so there was a five minute increase. Uh, and, I'm, I'm, you know, again, this isn't super, super scientific, but really the, the main variability here is the addition of the expert um, process in, in the whole clinical uh, scheme of things. So Dr. K here had an average of one hour 44 minutes during the, um, during the analogous year, one year ago period. Um, and then it's one hour 29 minutes during the expert period. Well, we don't know why there was a significant decrease here, but to me what I take away from this is there was no negligible increase in time. And I think that's a really important concept to make. I've shared this data with my providers and, um, and uh, intuitively they agree. Uh, they say, you know what, I, I agree. It hasn't really taken that much time with the process that, that we've developed. So, so anyway, I think that's what we can come out of this. Uh, uh, the, the, the end number in this statistical analysis is, um, uh, again, uh, 20, 2,482, I believe, uh, with this. Uh, and then this was um, similar numbers. So anyway, this is, uh, to me, this was very eye-opening. Uh, the referral process is really, really interesting because uh, here we go again with the back end uh, problems. So, so what we looked at was during a 12-month period in, in 2012 uh, at the Youngstown site and the same 12-month period at Warren West in 2012, this was, uh, this was the, the breakdown in terms of referrals. So, and, and I'm not going to go over every number, but, um, but just to get, get us started, for depression, we had 48 referrals made in, uh, in all of 2012. Uh, we looked at the intensity of the referral rate. 
Um, so this number just measures more or less intensity. We wanted to know um, what was the percent of referrals to the total visits during that time period, and it was 0.7 percent. So 0.7 percent of our patients were being referred for depression. Um, there were 10 people out of this 48 that kept the referrals uh, for around 21 percent uh, kept referral rate. Okay, and then, then you can see the same thing for alcohol and drugs, but no one kept their referrals, but we only had one, one referral. So again, I go back to the, the sarcastic remark to my uh, staff, boy, we got a really healthy population in Youngstown. Um, so here's Warren West, the control. Pretty similar numbers. Um, we, we only had 26 referrals here for an intensity visit of 0.3%, 0.43%, and then uh, only a 15% kept rate. But again, here, no one kept their, um, their alcohol and drug appointments, but we only had one. So anyway, I, to me, this is pretty dismal. Um, OK, so, so here is our comparison during the test period, again, February through August. So now we have 97 referrals in a six-month period. Again, that's compared to a 12-month period here. So we, in six months, we doubled the whole year's um, referral of depression. 97. And look at the intensity. It's 3.51%. Uh, so again, this goes back to that whole concept of awareness. Um, we're identifying people and, and we're more aware. Um, 30 kept their appointments. Uh, so our referral kept rate improved a little bit uh, by about 10%. So, you know, so it seemed like it has some, the expert process has some bearings there. Uh, because again, remember, this expert did not affect just the providers, it affects the whole staff um, down there. So everybody becomes aware of this. Um, in, uh, at our control site, a um, little, little bit better than, than last year's. Um, again, I'm, I'm going to attribute that to these confounding variables. But our referral cap rate was 17.65% compared to 15%. So those numbers are pretty similar. But look at the uh, alcohol and drug referral cap. So we did, we did make a significant improvement in referring our alcohol and drug folks, but nobody keeps their appointment, um, 0%, uh, at our test site as well as our control site. And, uh, and the way we, we know this is um, we had our referral clerks uh, call the, uh, the referred agencies to see if they kept their appointments or if they didn't keep their appointments. And, um, and you know, so this to me was very, very eye-opening and very interesting. And I think what this does for me is it makes the case for the, the, the so-called integrative healthcare model. Um, you know, if we were able to do, do the warm handoffs, if we had uh, behavioral health workers on site or readily available, uh, we could take them, walk them over right then and there. Um, and when I talked with the referral clerks, um, they said that the average uh, appointment lag time uh, from the time that we requested an appointment to the time they had the appointment was about two to three weeks. So, you know, so yeah, two to three weeks, they're, they're not going to keep it. And, um, and it, to me, it's always better uh, to take action at that point in time when you got them in, in your building, when you just saw them, and they just answer these questions and the providers talk to them. Um, it would be great if we could just get them over to the um, to the behavioral health person right then and there. But I think that this makes the case for this uh, integrative health um, model that um, that I think is, is uh, just around the corner, hopefully. Uh, intervention analysis. We couldn't really do a whole lot of intervention analysis because um, we don't really have anything to compare it with. Um, uh, there's not a place. Uh, we had to build it into our EHR, um, the, the, um, the intervention documentation locations. But um, so we didn't really have uh, anything to compare this with last year or with the with the, uh, control site. But um, but we did make some uh, interventions here. And again, um, by itself, it doesn't really mean a whole lot except for the fact that uh, we are making um, we made 869 interventions. Um, out of that 2,400 people that, um, that we did do the expert on. So uh, 
I, I forget if there were any. Uh, I think there were some administrators, nine percent, I believe, uh, on the on the call here. Um, so th this was our startup cost. This was it. That, that's all there was to it. We we uh, spent some time uh, training for expert, uh, some motivational interviewing training, and so forth. And that's that's all we deemed as our cost. And it's um, when you broke it down, and again, this is just at one site. It was seven hundred thirty-one dollars and one cent. Um, my, our CFO told me to make sure I put the one cent here. Um, our paper supplies, um, you know, for the uh, the, the, the expert pre-screening was done on paper, uh, so that was given at the front desk. Um, so the paper supplies cost around thirty-five dollars, and so our total startup cost was seven hundred sixty-six dollars and one cent. Um, I didn't put my time in there. Um, uh, that would have tripled this. No, I'm just kidding. But, uh, but anyway, um, but I, the, the point about this slide is uh, it's minimal cost. Um, of course, there's always case stories. I have lots of them, but just a couple of uh, illustrations here. Um, just recently, one of our nurse practitioners told me uh, a story about this lady who came in with significantly severe respiratory distress. Uh, she was in really, really bad shape. They they gave her aerosols and and um, they stabilized her and uh, and and she was doing really well after about an hour. And they were going to discharge her, um, uh, but right before they discharged her, the nurse practitioner uh, looked at looked at her expert scores and uh, and her PHQ9, and she was at a very high level, and she was actually suicidal at that that moment in time. And uh, and the nurse practitioner told me that she said, you know, I would never have even thought, I was so focused on on managing this respiratory problem that I would have never thought to ask about any type of behavioral thing. And, and when I saw that, I, I was stunned, and, and I went and explored that with her, and, um, and then we, we did get uh, uh, get her some help, and, and she said, I think she would have committed suicide that night if we didn't help her. So, you know, that's that's one of many, many stories that we've gotten since we started this. Um, I, again, you know, as they say, the, the teeth is not separated from the body, the mind is. And, and, and I don't think behavioral health issues are separate from physical um, problems. We all know that there's a lot of comorbid conditions. The, the drinking problem pregnant patient is where um, this lady comes in and she's diagnosed a pregnancy and they do the pregnancy workup and, um, and you know, they were going to... Um, go ahead and do the usual referrals to OB and so forth. And, um, and it turns out that uh, her expert and her DAST indicated that she had a pretty significant drinking problem. Um, so, you know, so, um, so that was at least identified and, uh, and she was talked to and, and so forth. Um, I don't know if she was referred, but obviously if she was referred, she didn't go because we know that there's a 0% rate of, uh, of uh, alcohol types of people um, going to um, their um, appointments for referral. But, but anyway, the, the point here is, is that obviously drinking and being pregnant uh, don't go hand in hand. And, you know, so hopefully we were able to save this person's um, uh, baby from any type of um, anomalies and, and distress and so forth. So anyway, uh, and again, there's many, many more stories um, to this. Um, I, I think for me, and, and I'll just share this, uh, it's, it's a personal story. Uh, I, I told you at the beginning that uh, my interest seems from uh, personal experience. My, um, my dad was a longtime military person. He was a career military guy. And uh, in 1966, he, was, um, he had 21 years in, and um, he was um, early in the year, he was um, uh, had orders to uh, be deployed for Vietnam, and uh, he didn't really want to go. Uh, he, was, he was, I think he just, well, in 66, he just turned 40. He didn't want to go and, and so forth. And then later in the year, or a couple weeks later, I guess, he was diagnosed with diabetes. Well, his, his love in his life was uh, cooking. He, he loved cooking, and, uh, and he, he made great foods. Um, and, uh, and that was his passion. And, but the problem was he, he loved eating, too. And 
so he did gain weight, considerable weight over time, and uh, and I believe that's what set off the, uh, the diabetes. And anyway, so he decided to retire from the military. Uh, well, the Army was his love, too. He'd been in the Army, um, you know, since, since he was very young, and uh, but he was at, he could retire, he had enough years to retire, so he retired, and then he had to curve his diet. Well, those were two passions that he had, and, um, and so over time, uh, he would, whenever he went to the doctors, um, the focus was on his blood sugar and his weight. But no one ever asked him, you know, how are you doing? You know, how do you feel? Are you okay? Um, and, and what was happening was all along he was getting depressed uh, because he couldn't practice his passion anymore. So, so as time went on, uh, he got more and more depressed. And the more depressed he got, the, the more um, um, his diabetes got out of control and his sugar levels would go up and everybody would yell at him, my mom, uh, the doctors, and, and so forth. And so his, his, his depression got worse. Uh, and the more his depression got worse, the, the more his diabetes got worse. And, and it was this you know, this back and forth thing, well, um, he ended up committing suicide. Um, he was so depressed, he, he just couldn't deal with it. Well, back then, and even now, um, we, we don't do that. We, we're not asking, as medical providers, we're not asking these people, do you have a problem? Uh, and, and I think that's a problem for us. Um, we, we're not identifying, and, and as physicians, as medical practitioners, we should be asking. That's part of the... Um, part of the, uh, the, the medical delivery system. We as doctors, I believe, it is our responsibility to do this. So anyway, uh, and, and I think y you all have probably myriads of stories that you can share uh, like this. Uh, but to me, th this is a great start doing this expert. Um, um, and, you know, and I think it makes sense. And some of our preliminary data shows that uh, it is saving lives. for. So for that $736 that it cost us, um, we, we actually have saved lives. And in my world, if you save one life, then, then you've, you've done a lot in a lifetime. So anyway, so uh, I'm, I'm to the question and comments section again. So uh, please, if, if there's any questions, comments, please, uh, please ask. So, Hi. Uh, yes, I do have a few. OK. Um, let's see here. Uh, World Health Organization reports 75 percent of population is low risk for abuse or dependence issues. Would you expect to see 25 percent positive screens over enough time? Um, Chris, I'm sorry, could you read that question again? Um, I, I'm not sure if I totally understand the question. Sure. The World Health Organization okay reports that 75% of the population is low risk or uh, low risk for substance abuse or dependence issues. Given enough time, uh, would you expect to see 25% positive screen? Um, probably. I, I, I guess I would statistically, if, if um, you know, on a very large scale, that was the, the ratio, then, then I, I would expect so. Now, um, just as a background, our organization is an, is an FQHC, a federally certified health center, and our mission is to provide health care to the medically uninsured, underserved, uh, underinsured population. So they are uh, more of the, 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 the poor, the, the, the poverty-stricken types of folks. Uh, I believe, and, and again, I, I don't have any of my um, references with me, but I believe that I've read where uh, different population segments tend to have different rates of, um, of um, substance abuse and, and uh, drug, drug addiction and, and so forth. Um, and I believe in our population it may be a higher um, rate. Um, so, and again, I don't have those references in front of me, but um, so in, in so I guess my point is, is that we may expect a higher rate. And, and again, the whole exercise here to me is that um, that we historically have not done a very good job identifying who these people are. Uh, and I believe this whole process does help, help us um, identify them and, 
and to be able to do interventions in a more timely um, and appropriate manner. I'm not sure if I really answered that question adequately, but um, that's kind of off the top of my head is what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I'm going to unmute Kara here. She has a question about referrals. Okay, great. Okay. Um, Kara? Hi, Karen. Um, yes. Hi, Kara. Hi, Kara. I really um, appreciate it. Um, Kara? Yes? Okay, go ahead. Um, I really appreciate you showing the, the key points of the expert process. And one of the things that we've found at our site is that we have very few uh, people who are referred to treatment actually utilizing that referral. And we contact them within 48 hours to schedule an appointment for a more in-depth intake or start treatment. Um, so we feel like we do have a reasonably warm handoff and quick turnaround of time to engage that person. But um, unless there's any kind of court involvement or employer involvement, it, it is hard to get somebody to kind of all of a sudden be told that they have an alcohol problem and that they're not, they're not expected to kind of take ownership and action for it. So I just didn't know if you had any other experience with sites that had kind of successful strategies for converting referrals into treatment patients. Okay. Um. Some of it was uh, muscle coming across, but I think I got most of uh, what you were saying, Kara. Um, um, you know, we we didn't we, we wanted to see the raw data first before we uh, we put anything uh, the so-called artificial types of things in, um, like having coaches and and uh, and calling them back for We we wanted to see what what they were doing uh, without any kind of um, uh, interventions from that perspective where you know where we're, we're uh, aiding their referral um, uh, uh, process so so uh, yeah, and that's why we only did it for six months because uh, once we got the data then then we can go to the next step which would be hey we got a real problem with uh, our referral kept uh, rates so what we're doing is um, um, uh, we we're we're in the process of looking uh, at creating a behavioral, well, there's several processes going on. One is creating a behavioral health model where we have behavioral health workers um, uh, on site. Uh, I, I, I read an article once, uh, there's, a, there's a group, uh, I believe it's an FQHC out in Colorado uh, who does this, who have embedded behavioral health workers in the clinical setting. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense and I think that's what we want to get to. Uh, and that way we would do the warm warm handoffs. Um, yeah, I think the 48 calling back uh, the 48 hours is, is a great idea type of thing too. Um, um, we haven't really looked at that part. The other thing is we are working with our local behavioral health care partners to create true um, integration and co-location types of settings. In fact, um, at one of our sites, we're looking at uh, relocating our our, whole, our entire clinical program to a site about about a tenth of a mile as the crow flies uh, from our current location uh, to a location where there's a uh, adult behavioral health organization on one side and a pediatric behavioral health organization on the other side, and there's a strip of land available in the middle, and we want to build a new site there. And, and have a true co-location, true uh, integrative healthcare service. But I think the key here is, is uh, you know, I, I think again going back to that warm handoff, you know, holding their hands and taking them there, and and doing it real time, uh, the real time interventions, uh, the real time referrals. I think is going to be the answer because I don't think, you know, let's let's face it, a lot of these folks cannot be responsible for themselves. They they're they're sick and. Um, and to expect them to be responsible to keep appointment two or three weeks later, I don't think it's going to going to occur. And, and obviously, it doesn't with our data. Um, it's showing that uh, they're not going to keep it. And when I talk to my behavioral health care partners in, in our area, um, they they all concur. Yeah, it's not going to happen. You know. So I don't know, Kara. I, I, again, you, you it, it came across somewhat muffled on this side. But um, did I did I? Answer or make the appropriate comments to your question. 
Kara, do you need any more information? I unmuted you. Well, I guess she must be okay. Because okay. she has an email back. Okay, here's um, another question. Um, do you are you doing ESPER with your child and adolescent patient? No, uh, not at this point. Our plan was um, we would start with the uh, 18 and older group um, at the beginning. Uh, again, we tested it at the Youngstown site. We're in the middle of spreading it now, so we, we spread it to our other sites, uh, only in medical at this point and only those 18 and older. Uh, our next step is going to be dental. Um, uh, we've been working through the logistics of doing uh, ESPER to the dental uh, program. Part of the reason is half of our patients are dental patients, uh, and then half of those dental patients are medical patients. So that means we're missing 25% of screening uh, of our total uh, patient population. So, um, so we, we felt that it was really important that we get to the dental as soon as we can. So our plan is uh, starting in January, we're going to spread it to our dental um, uh, patients. And then, um, then the third phase, hopefully by next summer, we can start the, the, the kids. Um, we, we operate two strictly pediatric sites, uh, and that's where, where we'll, we'll start it. One of the reasons we, we didn't start with peds is because um, it's, a, it's a little bit uh, encumbering uh, because of um, the, um, uh, the, the patients or, or um, the, the parents' um, approval of us doing those things, and, and you have to go through the parents, and sometimes the parents don't want uh, you to you know, ask their kids, teenage kids, these questions and so forth. Um, so we're still kind of working out the logistics on there. What, the, the pediatric behavioral health site that I was telling you about um, uh, have started their expert uh, at their location. So we're going to try to learn from them, uh, too, before we, we implement it in the PED site. So it's kind of a phased uh, type of thing. So 18 and older first, the dental patients, and then the, um, the, the PED patients. Okay. Um, have you had any success in getting patients who are not alcohol or drug dependent, but who are drinking at high risk levels to cut down on their drinking and or drug use as a result of the brief intervention by a provider? Um, yes, and I don't, I don't have the firm data, uh, and that's why I didn't present it, this, but looking at it, um, uh, as you may recall, I talked about uh, looking at serial expert scores, uh, the serial scores of the DAST and, and the audit and so forth. Uh, and preliminary uh, findings show that, uh, that there, there, it is improving. Uh, uh, and, and some of these interventions are simply where the doc uh, or the provider just, just talks to them. And, and, um, you know, and so they're not like full blown out type of uh, interventions where they're making these heavy-duty referrals or anything like that. So, but but looking at the serial scores uh, of specifically the the DAST and the audit and the PHP nine, it does look like there's a trend of improvement. Uh, so I do believe that um, to answer this question, I do believe that the expert process is helping with the um, um, w with those uh, those people that have those problems. Okay. Um, have you gone to sites, or would you be willing to go to sites and actually train Esper? Um, Chris, it, it was it was kind of hazy there. Could you? Okay. Repeat it? Um, have you gone to places to train Esper, or would you be willing to go and do that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what um, I, I I've done uh, a couple of local lectures. Um, there's a um, uh, a local organization uh, called Neil Kennedy uh, up in Youngstown, and uh, and they're very active. In fact, that's where I first uh, learned of Espert. Um, uh, Doug Doug Wentz and Jerry Carter, uh, if you're on this call, uh, kudos to you. But um, but they uh, they introduced me to Espert, and uh, and they have regular Espert training up there. Um, so I have done some lectures uh, on on that. Um, I think Doug asked me to do something down in Columbus. Uh, but yeah, I, I I believe in this 
so much, especially with the data now, and then again with my personal experience that, you know, I, I'm, I'm advocating that, um, that, you know, that this, this happens. Um, in fact, uh, I have some, some other things. I think I have just a couple more slides, um, which, which kind of goes into this. But, uh, you know, some of the conclusions here with SBIRT is, um, you know, we, we are, the whole staff, it's just not the doctors or the nurse practice, it's everybody. We're all aware now that, hey, there's a lot of people with these problems. Uh, and, and I showed you that our diagnostic rates have improved. Um, our, you know, our patients don't have a problem. There, there's a little bit of a myth out there that patients won't tell us, but they will. Um, they, they don't have a problem disclosing these um, behavioral health issues. And the time commitment uh, is minimal, as you can see. And, and that's six months worth with a significant amount of data. And we didn't see an increase in, in time commitment here. Um, and there is minimal startup cost for, for, you know, for what we did. I suppose you could do is something a little bit more fancier. But, but you know, we didn't have to really do a whole lot um, to, to start this up. Uh, and we do know that patients don't go to referrals, and uh, and we know that medical providers are not too good with it. The nurse practitioners are far better than the docs on this, and I don't mean to beat up on the docs, because I am one. But um, but I, I'm going to tell you that uh, that the nurse practitioners are much more aware. I think they're more holistic minded anyway. Uh, and then again, expert can save lives. So and I don't mean to be long winded here, but uh, but that's yes, uh, I am willing to do anything that. That um, that I can do about anybody. And please, if anybody has any one-on-one -on -one questions or one-on-one -on -one questions, can please call me. I, I don't know if my contacts information is out there. Well, they can uh, they can email us, and we can forward okay. those to you. Okay. Um, I've got. I know we're right at the end here, but I've got two more questions. Okay. Um, can you answer them? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you have a referral list available um, with agencies that are aware of your study, or do you have some of those services available within your health agency on an appointment basis? Um, yes, we um, uh, for two years in a row now, we our organization hosted a, uh, a summit uh, in where we invited um, all the behavioral health organizations within two, two of our biggest counties um, to, to be involved. And uh, the participation rate was, I believe, almost 100%. But uh, so, so yes, everyone is aware of our study, our work, and so forth. And, um, and one, of the last, uh, one of the things that came up in the last summit was um, there's barriers uh, uh, that occur when, when we make referrals um, to behavioral health. And I believe there's barriers coming back to us. So one of the, 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 the big b barriers is um, a lot of our local behavioral health organizations want us to um, uh, let the patients make the appointment uh, and, and not us. Uh, so in other words, the patient becomes responsible for, for making the appointment and getting there. And, uh, and that becomes a real barrier because most patients won't call or, or won't, won't do that. And, and I understand from the behavioral health side why that's done, but uh, but we are meeting with uh, various organizations um, to try to work through that. So, um, uh, I, I, Chris, I can't remember the other part of the question. That was uh, the list. Um, yeah, it's just do you have a list of uh, referrals yeah. available or someplace in house that you can refer them to? Yes, yes. Uh, oh, and I think the other part of the question was do we have anything in, internal? And uh, I mentioned Neil Kennedy before, but Neil Kennedy uh, has been gracious enough to have a behavioral health worker 20 hours a week at our site. Um, uh, she's not a, um, uh, a licensed independent social worker or anything like that, but she's, she has behavioral health work experience. And I think that's helped. Uh, but the 20 hours is a real detriment. Uh, that's better than nothing. But, um, but uh, uh, it seems like, just like anything else, it seems like the a lot of these patients tend to uh, tend to come when um, uh, when she's not there. So, um, but it, it just amplifies or, or, or uh, promotes the idea that we we do need uh, uh, in-house uh, behavioral health types of folks. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then it looks like just one other question and a comment. Okay. Um, 
do you have to complete GIPRAs for your screens? Uh, is your clinic part of the national grant for experts? Complete what? GIPRA, G-P-R-A, <coughs> um, the evaluation. Oh, I don't know what G-P-R-A is. No, um, Dr. Quinnells, um, the federal government expert grantees have to complete a separate evaluation. So no, oh. you wouldn't have a GIPRA. Okay, okay. okay. Um, yeah, we, we didn't get a grant for this at all. This is something we just did internally. Um, so we, you know, we have no reporting requirements other than, um, you know, our HRSA grant, uh, and I explained earlier about the UVS, and um, uh, that's really the only reporting that we have. Okay. And then um, the last comment, which I'm sure is shared by a lot of people, um, Dr. Shandon says he really enjoyed your talk. Oh, thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you. That, thank you so much. Uh, that uh, Again, this is, I, I guess, like my dad's passion was eating. Uh, this is my pad. This this makes a lot of sense. And you know, I, I should have gone into psych probably, but I didn't. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, but this is um, this is very interesting to me, and I think it's it's very much needed. And um, in in my last slide here, um, just to finish it up, um, I, I think to me, I, I'm I'm a big believer in this integrative uh, or collaborative healthcare delivery process. It, it just makes so much common sense uh, to do this. Uh, the PCMH, the patient center medical home, or the health home development, I think is a must because I think we can improve our coordinated healthcare delivery. Um, I, I, I strongly encourage implementation of SBIRT at all medical practices. Uh, again, if you can save one life, then 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 you know you've lived a good life, I think. So. And then, uh, and then continue to encourage legislative adv advocacy to support screening and integrative efforts. So uh, I, think, I think that's it. So um, that, that concludes my, my part. So if there's any more questions uh, or if we ran out of time, I don't mind um, having uh, questions emailed to me or, or call me. Um, I'll, be, I'll be very glad to, to answer any questions. Okay. Well, thank you so much. It was very, very informative. I just have a couple short um, um, housekeeping uh, notes to pass on. Um, about two hours after this webinar, all the attendees will receive a GoToWebinar email with a link to an evaluation. And we strongly encourage you to please um, click on that link and do the evaluation for this. You can leave your comments on there, too. We want to know what you like how it can be better. Um, and so this is very important to us. Tomorrow morning, you will receive an email from me, this is Chris, uh, with a link to the PowerPoints, the link to this recorded webinar, and also um, a link to order any CEUs that, that we offer. So look for that tomorrow morning, and look for the evaluation later today. Um, I appreciate everybody's attendance. So look forward to seeing you on future webinars. So at this we will close the webinar today. Thank you all, and again, thank you, Dr. Duanel. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Holly. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.